Okay, um, I just thought I'd start off by saying this is pretty damn exciting for me. Um, I don't mind the sound of my own voice and um, for the majority of time being a farmer, there's no one there to hear it. So today's pretty exciting, I've got a room full. Um, I just wanted to quickly go through uh, the basic structure of what I wanted to talk about. First of all was just to give you a quick overview of what we've done at home on our, um, at Cooter Park. Then just run through some stuff about, I'm often asked, you know, this is great, this feed conversion testing and starting up these blueies, have you made any difference and, and what sort of difference is that? And then I wanted to just get down into a bit more of a practical part of a little bit of a take home thing, not all about me, um, some stuff that you just might be able to think about on your farms at home. Um, so just the blueies is obviously a short on Angus cross, very simple, 50% short on, 50% Angus. Uh, the dam side is the short horns, the um, sire side is the angus. Why that way? At that particular time, um, obviously the information available on angus size was obviously much larger than it is for the, sh the short horn breed. Uh, so we went that way. We create the bluey which is 50-50 and then put the blueys over the bluey and so on down the, down the range, um, down the, over time. We're up to probably five, six generations now with the Blueys. Um, so the whole herd is recorded with Angus Australia. Fortunately, they let us in to the multi-breed register. Um, so we've got full EBVs on our um, bulls, uh, including net feed intake or feed conversion um, information. I'm just going to, I'll get in trouble from Steve for this, but um, I'm just going to talk about feed conversion, net feed intake it's the same thing. Let's just leave it at feed. Net f um, let's leave it at feed conversion at this particular stage. That's what we understand. The method that we go around in selecting for feed conversion is net feed intake. If we get into that sort of stuff, it just gets too confusing. My job today is to talk about our program. I'm not going to go into the background of what net feed intake is about and how we decided it and what use it is and all that sort of stuff. I'm just going to tell you what we've done. Uh, so we're still the only herd in Australia to be testing for feed conversion. Um, so um, we wanted to incorporate feed conversion in the selection process of our cattle. Um, obviously my time that I spent at Trangy at the research station, which I was incredibly fortunate with, and they were testing hundreds and hundreds of cattle there through the feed conversion testing facility. I was fortunate enough that I could be there at the end of a test of 200 heifers, I could go and get the top 20 heifers and put them in a yard there and the bottom 20 heifers and put them in a yard there and stand and look at them and try and work out what does a high feed converting animal look like and what does a poor feed converting animal? From my point of view, I'm not much of a judge, but there was, to me, there was, you just couldn't tell it. There was breed, different breeds in those ones, tall, short, fat, and thin in that one, tall, short, fat, and thin in that one. So, and I was lucky enough to be in a situation where I got to see that and I got to gain the confidence in the trait, which is feed conversion. So, got very excited, decided I'd leave the department, go home to the family farm and um, start up this pathetically strange idea of <laughs> Uh, the bluey cattle and testing for feed conversion. So why the, um, in our, oh, d we, we're about developing a line of cattle. I really don't have any desire to start up a breed or anything like that, get involved with breed societies and all that stuff and all the people side of it. I just want to develop a line of cattle, go on in time, and if other people want to do it, they can do it um, independently of me, maybe under some similar structures or something like that. But it's, it's just about creating, I just want to be competitive with any other line of cattle or breed of cattle and do the best job we can. So why this structure obviously, um, it's pretty simple, but the first thing, first thing was the recognition of the marbling. Um, that was the beautiful work that was done by the CIC, said that that was a really, really important trait and um, a sort of a, a benchmark should be set as far as us going into the future of breeding cattle. The ability to access genetics from large performance recording herds was another Another fact that I put in there, uh, desire to produce a multi-trait animal uh, for our clients uh, in a responsible and balanced way. And the last one there is just about saying there's a big variation within breeds. Um, you can find good and bad in every single one, whichever ever breeds you do want to put into your, your composite, it'll be about the animals that you choose from within that breed and then the strategy that you go about in breeding over time. So I don't think it really matters which breed you start with, it's um, a completely individual thing. 
So this is our um, efficiency testing facility. When I went home to the farm, there was nobody else was doing it. So we just had to come up with a bit of a design. It's, people get really disappointed when they come to our place and expect to see this big flash efficiency testing facility. It's just 48 individual pens um, built with just with electric fencing and feed and water supplied. Um, we needed to have all the pens set up in a way that you know there, there was no difference between them. So we built the facility, 48 pens, uh, we're recording the daily intakes. The, the uh, standards that were set by the Department of Primary Industry or DPI or whatever they're called now um, is a 70 day test and we're ma ma manually measuring the intakes of the animals. So you can see there there's, we just built ourselves a bit of a feed cart, we come along there every day and measure the amount of feed that we're, we're giving them each day. Uh, at so uh, we're on to now test 33 and over 800 bulls that we've tested through the facility so far. Um, just a bit of a fun time, I've probably got nothing to do with anything at all really. But, um, Arnie's a bit of a good, good feed converter you might say. Feed consumed and weight gain over the 70 days giving us feed conversion figure. Just an example, roughly 700 kilograms uh, eaten, 100 kilograms gain gives us a conversion of 7 to 1. Everyone understand that? That's just feed conversion, nothing in uh, In the testing over the, the 12, 13, 14, 15 years we've been going, our best bull we've ever tested was about a 3.8 to 1, the worst 10 to 1. Just, there's a big range there and we've, we, we know that, but we're certainly all, also finding it. So it's just some basic points, I'm not going to get too complicated, but we now know that um, feed conversion is a heritable trait. It's about as heritable as growth. We're all happy to go out and select for growth. We know the gains we can make with that. Feed conversion is up there with it. And there is a big variation in the population. So there's, there's good animals out there and bad animals. And um, if you want to, you can go and find the good ones and breed from those and make a difference. The last point is a bit of a, a, a grabby one. And um, I'm just putting it up there because we're, we are to the point now, it's always the question that's been asked. Great, go and do your feed conversion testing, do all that sort of stuff. We've got 8 metre by 8 metre square pens feeding them a diet. It's 70% um, oats, 30% uh, uh, loosen. So we do this test. We, we find and identify the bulls that are good feed converters. I use those in my herd. They produce progeny. Those female progeny grow up and become a cow and they're out in the paddock getting grass. Is that daughter of that bull that we identified as being a good converter, is she more efficient on grass? We're just about at the point, or we are at the point, it just hasn't been published yet, that that relationship is there. The Adelaide University and Wayne Pitchford and the group over there are to the stage now where they can confidently say that is true. And that's been a big, big part of the process of going through and the questions and the things that people have always put up going, yeah, yeah, nice stuff but we're not getting into that or we don't, how do you know or why should we or all these, that's a pretty big connection to make and it's taken a long time to do it and great work that's achieved it. Um, so conducting a feeding test, uh, feed efficiency test has the advantages of, so it is, it does cost money, people understand that. What are the things, obviously produce, uh, identifying animals that are good converters, um, we also put animals in a situation where they're growing pretty quickly. An average of two kilos a day is what we generally get. So we're getting a bigger range um, in, in growth for those animals that are being tested. Um, also a big factor I think is that after a 70 day test, we've got, we're, we're testing young bulls at the end of that 70 days, we've got a fair bit of fat on them. They're, they're eight, ten mils of fat on them. So when we're measuring the eye muscle area and the, and the fat and the marbling, we're getting a bigger range. And you, you know when you get a bigger range, it's, you get the ability to find the more superior animals. I know there's some real concerns in breed societies about doing those measurements on yearling bulls that haven't got enough fat on them. They're not getting the range and it's producing um, incorrect. So that's an advantage, I think. Making, um, having all the animals on a set period, year after year after year after year, uh, make, making good comparisons for your selection. Uh, makes the animals quiet, a bit of a kickstart for the wiener bulls and a reduction in feed out in the paddocks. Um, we were very fortunate enough to have a student from Adelaide University do a masters on all the data that we'd created at home. 
Um, a real honour and um, very, very interesting. So the basic quick three things there was that she wanted to investigate uh, Jen Cook from Adelaide Uni, I should acknowledge her. She wanted to investigate um, if we've made any genetic progress over time. Um, how had our herd changed for the other important traits? So the basic old thing, great select for feed conversion, but what happens if it's got repercussions that might be negative for uh, profitability? And is uh, there anything, is hybrid vigour associated with feed conversion? I haven't answered that one, but the last question, uh, the answer is no. So um, just some quick graphs, remembering all the time with feed conversion, the more negative, the better it is. So over time, over the years, this is our EBV for, for feed conversion. This is the change that we've made over time. Starting obviously at zero, um, we're now down to the, our whole herd having an average of about 0.4 to 0.5 um, net feed intake EBV. I'm sorry if you don't understand that, I don't have the time to explain it. We'll keep going. So the intake traits, again coming from that, as you'd expect, we've improved gross feed conversion and gross feed conversion is really what we're trying to improve. We just want to do it in a sensible way and that's why we use net feed intake. So both those traits there, have, we've reduced the amount of um, feed that our animals are eating in relation to the amount of weight they're putting on. They're still putting on weight, better growth rates, eating a little bit less. Um, so how much is that change? Whew. I was a very nervous man, I can tell you, when I got the results from, um, from Jen about this. And when I saw that figure, I went, holy dooly, what a waste of time this has been. Do you mean I have been testing for 12, 15 years and I've made a 3% change in my feed conversion? That was scary. The thing was then to try and have a look at how I could get a gauge on whether that was um, good or bad or what difference, what financial difference did that have to make. So the first thing to understand um, is when we're looking at feed conversion, every time we make a little bit of a difference in an animal, we're making that difference in every single animal across our herd. So we can realise that difference on every single animal, whether it's the steer, the heifer, the cow, the bull, every day of the year, every year. Um, if we're comparing to growth, and which we did there with the Angus breed, um, so they've achieved an 8% change in growth, in 400 day growth, in 18 years. We've made 3% genetic change, we're talking, in feed conversion. With feed conversion, I can put it across the whole herd. With growth, when calculating through to, to work out what return you're getting on that investment or that change, you can only acknowledge that extra growth in the animals that you sell. So in our herd, we've got 1,300 animals. We're only selling 500 a year. So I can only attribute that 8% gain to those 500 animals that I'm selling, not the whole herd, whereas in the feed conversion, I can do it on the, the whole herd. Okay, the, the um, analysis that Jen did also looked at the other traits. And so I supplied her with all our data, fertility data, even structural soundness data, everything we possibly could and she analyzes as much. So we've increased, great, um, at the same time as in improving our feed conversion, we've increased our weight gain, we've increased our eye muscle area, we've increased our marbling and we've had a decrease in fat, which is, is to be accepted, you know. I wish I had more time to talk about the in relationship between feed conversion and the fat. All I want to say on that is there is an association, it's the only thing. So it always gets talked about because it seems to be the only thing that's correlated with feed conversion. The correlation isn't that strong. It's not as strong as the relationship between growth and fat and a whole lot of other traits, but it's the one thing that is correlated, so it gets talked about. People have a strong association between fat and fertility, and it's all understandable, but the relationship is manageable, and that, there's a lot to talk about in that area. Um, but. The, the, the encouraging thing was that in, in the analysis that Jen did on, on our data showed that we'd actually increased fertility over the same time that we'd um, improved our feed conversion. So that was very, and quite significantly. So um, now we just want to take the next step on. This is all very nice, John, you've done this stuff. Um, Kuda Park Bluey, line of cattle are going on, great. You've apparently made some differences. I want to know what that means in financial terms. And that's bloody hard to do because no one can tell me what a kilogram of grass is worth. What I'm doing by making my animals better converters, I'm 
using up less of the grass each day. Now what does that mean in terms of dollars? So in a grass fed system I'm just trying to work out this. Now there's lots of scientists and very intelligent people in the room so just go with me on this one. This is my little method and it's, it's not fail safe but it's just a method. And it's not about the reality is I wanted to work out is it 0.7 cents, is it 7 cents, is it 70 cents, is it 70 dollars? You know it's not the so I just thought, like, let's pretend in my operation I am um, have my 500 cow herd and at the end of the year I can say, well, those two paddocks over there, that's the equivalent of what I've saved in feed. What am I going to do with that grass? And I'm just trying to think of a way that we can do it. So I said, look, well, let's just pretend, this is all pretend stuff, let's put a backgrounding steer on that and see what we, we, we could have achieved with that grass that we saved. So a background steer, we just roughly know he makes a dollar a kilo for us. Happy with that? Pull me up if you're not. Um, looking at the gains that we can make from that steer being on that grass that we've saved by our more efficient cattle, um, he's on average, you know, in a good system is going to go at um, 0.7 kilos a day. Um, oh dear. Um, <laughs> so to achieve that one kilogram, 1.4 days to get there. Yep. Um, if you don't understand, it doesn't matter, we haven't got time. Uh, steers, so we're just going to work on the 2.5% body weight um, he's going to consume. So a 400 kilogram steer, just saying that that backgrounding steer on average at the time he's on your place is 400 kilograms. So a 400 kilogram steer eating 2.5% about 10 kilos. Therefore he's eating 14.3 uh, kilograms of feed per kilogram gain. Therefore, we're getting paid one dollar for that kilogram gain. We convert that over for a 14.3 kilograms eaten. We come up with a value of grass at seven cents. If you're not happy with it, uh, that's fine. Uh, but you can, you can set that spreadsheet up really, really easy. And that's, I just wish I had more time to go through some of this stuff. Because, you know, when you vary those numbers, and it's a set up in a spreadsheet just with your seven cents at the end, you increase the amount you're being paid, your grass is worth more. You, decrease, uh, you increase their weight gain, your grass is worth more. You 2.5%, you change that, you improve their feed efficiency, your grass is worth more. You've got a heavier animal, your grass is worth less. You put all those, all those variables go through there, it's quite interesting how it just spits out the changes this seven cents at the end. Let's just go with it. Quickly over this one, that's confusing, but I've just done it with my herd. Numbers of animals, the weight that they are, two and a half percent of their body weight, kilograms of feed uh, consumed per year, um, total tons, three percent change, going through the whole thing there. So with that three percent change in my herd, every year I'm saving 145 tons of feed every year, year after year by making that 3% change. Now you might think that's a bit of a stretch. I just had to get myself to a place where I had something just to hold on to that um, um, gave me some, you know, just, just something in my head to say what's the, what's the dollar terms on this. So 145 tonnes at our 7 cents, 10,000 bucks, 361 big square bales of hay is what I'm saving in a real rough sense. What's that mean in real terms? You know, is that grass realisable? I don't know. I like to think of it in the way that I'm going to arrive at the drought 361 bales later than the bloke who's got the same number of cattle on the same property in the same system. Maybe I'm too simple, but, the, but that difference is real. It's, it's real. Those, and you can't see it as well as the growth or the you know, muscularity or the marbling, but it's real and it's there and it's proven. Um, so here's a quick one. Uh, we need to understand, and this is a bit harsh, I hope there's not too many seed stock producers in the room. Um, feed conversion is wholly and solely in the hands of um, the seed stock industry. Your commercial producers can't do anything about it, you can't select for it, maybe way down the track when gene markers come in. So it's, it's in those hands. Now the argument has always been with the seed stock producers, it's too expensive for us to test. Um, it's too expensive. I think we're getting to the point now, and this has been pretty harsh, but this, you know, the stud industry in some of the breeds has been brilliant. Long hard work, really breeding really good cattle, but they've been making some big bucks too. 
and the argument for some of those bigger studs now to say that they can't afford to test, maybe that argument is not there. And I'm, that's what I'm doing. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Okay. Just don't. Just a thought. <laughs> okay. Quickly on to the, um, the last part of the talk, which I just wanted to, to get something a bit more gritty for you to take home. So we're talking about management strategies. We're leaving all the breeding for feed conversion and that sort of stuff and the blueies behind at the moment. Um, no, they're still there along the bottom. That's great. Um, management strategies. So one thing that I've always looked in managing my herd at home is, is, is looking at that how can I save feed. I'm trying to do that in a, in a um, sense with feed conversion and genetics. Also, day to day, walking around. So when I get to that point and I've gone over to an early weaning system um, and so what I'm doing is early weaning, preg testing as soon as I, I, um, I wean, those cows turn into a, a, a different unit to be marketed and, and put as much weight on them as I can and then we've got a um, pregnant dry female. Potentially on how early you wean that can be for five to six months. Okay, what's her feed conversion? over those five to six months. One to nothing. Absolutely nothing. Well, now we've got to have her and we've got to have her there to be pregnant and produce the next cup. But the reality is her conver feed conversion is bad. No gain associated with that. So, um, so if we let her in those five or six months, if we let her, she will eat two and a half percent of her body weight. We know, and this is research that's been done, not my little head making this up, um, she will put on, uh, she will maintain herself at one to one and a half percent of her full body weight. Now in my situation with 500 cows walking around, that difference we're calculating down there is nearly half the amount of feed for that period of time and I just wanted to run through with you what difference that can make. Remembering all the time and we need to put the provisors in there, if you wean a calf off a cow and she's poor and you maintain her <laughs> all the way through, she'll be poor at calving and you don't want to poor cow calving so you, you might have to have a month of getting a couple of condition scores up or something. Okay so we're talking about fat cows now and this is the reality just going through you've seen cows like this I hope you don't have any cows like this at home but the reality is you see them around the place don't you um, you know we could go back to that table and on that table there you know what does it cost to feed a cow for a year? 351 bucks that's the people who keep that cow. That she was a good cow. She had a dead calf, but I'm going to keep it till next year and go through it. 351 bucks of grass. It's what she's, it's costing. More fat cows. This one's going to go very quickly. It's just an image that you can have in your head, have in your head as you're out in the paddocks looking at your cows, going, mm, okay, oh, that, that's what I don't want. So never, ever, ever compromise fertility. We know that. We're talking about after the cow is pregnant after the cow is pregnant. We're talking about this period of time. So quickly running through, I'm, I've just made the difference. There's only two areas here that we've changed is the 6.3 and the 9.9 .9 on those 500 dry cows and our 150 heifers. This is extreme. We're holding these animals back in some sort of form and reducing their intakes down to maintenance rather than just allowing them to eat what they want. The p figure is the one at the end there. 3,912. My, this is just with my herd. It was 4,800 tonnes of feed a year. By holding those cows back to their, say, 1.5% in, intake rather than 2.5, 900 tonnes of feed is the difference. Now that's extreme. I know we really can't achieve that. It'd be, you'd be doing well. And maybe there's room for that. Maybe there's a... Shane can open up a maintenance feedlot for cows and we can send them there and do something. But anyway, costing that through, that's the, the thing. 900 tonnes of feed, uh, um, $63,000. But if you only achieve a half or a quarter or a tenth of that, then that could be a, a real difference. And it's all about leaving grass in front of you all the time, what we're doing. We're leaving grass in front of ourselves, we're creating moisture, we're creating organic matter, all those different things. How to achieve is really hard, I guess, because we don't want to ruin our pastures, do we? You can achieve it, just leave the cows in the paddock and don't feed them. We don't want to ruin our pastures. Big mobs, small paddocks, um, putting them onto grass that's worth less per kilogram, um, and that's the same, you know, grass that achieves you less weight gain, uh, or maybe just being aware of it. Anyway, just in conclusion, um, 
selecting for net fee conversion, um, we've made a difference. Um, and that excites me incredibly because it would have been a big waste of time <laughs> otherwise. Um, uh, and we've been able to do that at the same time as increasing the other things. We had to be responsible. To be a good seed stock producer, I had to be responsible. I had to take feed conversion up, but I had to take the other traits with me. It was very easy to do a, you know, Belgian blue or a Wagyu type scenario where you've got one mega trait and leaving some other stuff behind. We wanted to take them all with us. Recognising that your, gra that, your, that your grass really does have a value is an important one. Understanding the requirements of your different classes of stock, that you're giving the feed to those classes of stock that are making you money and not to the others. And um, there's some big gains to be realised there. So, it's, oh, sorry about that. That was something about a bull sale that's on the 3rd of September. But, um, <laughs> anyway, sorry to rush that through. It was a bit there. Thank you very much for your passion and enthusiasm. Um, if you all like to drop me in the next Thank you. Thank you. <coughs>